Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. We have more on the impact of that devastating storm that destroyed a number of homes in and around the Medicine Hat region. We chat with UCP leadership hopeful Travis Taves, who explains why he should become the new Premier of Alberta this October. And searing hot temperatures along with dry conditions in a number of European countries has made life extremely difficult for many as wildfires continue to burn. Your nation, your province, your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Many people are finding themselves seeking temporary shelter as they rebuild homes devastated by Monday's windstorm in the Medicine Hat region. BCN's Jeanette Roche visited the area and filed the special report. Rex Olson points out where the porch and deck of his parents' house used to be. This is what was my room. In fact, all the buildings on the family's property have been destroyed. A house, a shop, um, another smaller uh, art studio, four other outbuildings, and a greenhouse. Um, so, all yeah, gone. all gone. My entire yard's trashed. My shop is now in my backyard. All of my dad's tools and all my motorbikes and dirt bikes were in it. And my trampolines up my fence line. This golf cart was found flipped upside down. It still works. This was upside down. Right there. The 13-year-old was home alone with his cousin when the house started shaking. Every window in the house broke. The entire house was uh, shaking on its foundation, I guess. Uh, the door slammed on my wrist. It's hurt. I dove into the bathtub in my bathroom and the entire roof of my house ripped off. He says it all happened so fast. It was about 10 seconds. I was just in the bathtub with zero electricity covering my head. So I was at work and uh, my wife called me in a complete panic. She didn't know if I was alive or not. And across the street from the Olsons property, more damage, homes missing roofs. Many homes off of Wholesome Road here in Cypress County have undergone damage. Behind me, a mobile home completely flipped over. The owner has lost part of his house and has a collection of classic cars that have been damaged. Take a drive down the street, you see downed trees and debris. In town, at least 71 electrical poles were down. However, in the coming days, we'll likely find more. And as of Tuesday, still about 100 homes without power. The city and county calling this a wind or severe weather event. Although there are unconfirmed reports that this was a tornado, Medicine Hat officials are not using the T word. Um, because I'm not a expert in this and this is where we truly do rely on those experts to be able to provide us with that information. Winds were reported at the airport from our sensor at 93 kilometers per hour, uh, but there was a, you know, a storm chase that had a handheld measuring device that reported a gust of up to 135 kilometers an hour. And, and some of the damage that we've seen uh, to the west of the city is consistent with wind speeds even higher than that. And so what we're now currently investigating is whether or not there could have been a tornado that was embedded within this system. But regardless of how it's being classified, those who were left in the storm's way are now dealing with its aftermath. No one expects this, but we will rebuild. For Bridge City News, I'm Jeanette Roche. Even though many were celebrating Parks Canada's official grand opening of the new interpretive centre in Waterton, there are some who are not happy about it. As BCN's Angela Stewart explains now, while some people appreciate the central hub for visitors, there are others who are simply not in favour of it. As you can see, as you look around you, it's a, it's a central showcase for the community. Located right in the centre of this small southern Alberta town, visitors to Waterton Lakes National Park can finally take in the newly built visitor and information centre. We were in construction mode for quite a while. Following the Kino wildfires in 2017, which demolished the town's original centre that was located just on the outskirts of the park, officials believed a new location for the facility would serve the community and visitors better. It's designed to be uh, a high uh, for the visitors who come to the park to learn a little bit about its culture and its history but also to invite them to go out and experience that in the park and that's one of the ways reasons it was designed the way it was. I feel like as a national park we should try and protect the land not put a bunch of cement over it. During a 2018 petition called Save the Waterton Field, many residents overwhelmingly opposed the location for the building as they believed it would cause traffic congestion and safety issues, adding it would also take away the playground that was in the area and spray park. I just think they really didn't utilize the space outside. They also just 
fit it into a bigger parking lot too. So I don't know, just kind of a waste of space if you ask me. Parker Byam and his family who own many cabins adjacent to the center say they are disappointed to see the original green space gone. That's a field that we all grew up playing games in and having, you know, lunches, activities, do, playing football. And some other locals say they are frustrated the new center now distracts from some of Waterton's picturesque views. I think that's beautiful, but it did kind of develop that area that everyone loved to play in and kind of took away some views. I think it's a great, great thing for the city or the towns. Despite the location, some nearby businesses say the center has been beneficial for them as it's been bringing in more customers. Found that this year we get in a lot of uh, extra business just from the numbers we're seeing and we're thinking it's due to this. The new $17.3 million building is open year round for the public, offering many exhibits, interpretive programming and services. For Bridge City News, I'm Angela Stewart. Canola roguing is an essential part of agriculture. Now, a Lethbridge-based recruiting team, Select People Solutions, is in need of people to pull out unwanted plants from the ground that are affecting the seeds. Ryan Miller, the director of the company, says the initiative is the largest employer of youth in our area for over 20 years. He says basically it's a glorified weed pulling job. They use labor to, to do that. It's not by machinery or, or chemicals. And so it's literally handpicked. So we have crews up to about 300 people that work the season to go ahead across, uh, and, and we do over a million acres of canola a year to go ahead and do this quality assurance check on these fields. Most of these people are under the age of 18, 90% would be, so it's a, a huge youth content to fill these crews and get out there and understand our world of agriculture. Miller says they still need people to fill some positions. If you're interested, you can always check out the Select People Solutions website. Well, it was another beautiful day for maybe pulling weeds, a bike ride through the coolies, or even a walk along Henderson Lake today. Jeanette Roche is in now with an early peek of the forecast. Jeanette, will those beautiful hot temperatures continue? Yes, extremely warm this week, Hal, and some humidity as well. This evening, we could see the potential of a thunderstorm developing and some winds from the west at 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, into Thursday, we're looking at warm, sunny conditions, 32 degrees. I did mention the humidity, right? We could see a humid X Thursday of 36. So that is very warm. After that, a lot more sunshine and maybe a few showers on the weekend as well. I'll have all those details coming up for you later on in the show. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. The cost of filling up your vehicle rose more than 50% in June compared with a year ago. Those prices are to blame for inflation skyrocketing to 8.1% last month. Stats Canada says that is up from 7.7% in May and marks the largest yearly change since 1983. The Bank of Canada says it's hoping to cool inflation by hiking its key interest rate by a full percentage point in its next rate decision. Interim federal conservative leader Candace Bergen says life continues to get worse for Canadians as inflation continues to soar. The cost of goods keeps going up. Everything from food, gas and rent goes up. Bergen says more needs to be done to help Canadians. Canadians are suffering with record high inflation and it's clear these Liberals have no plan to deal with it responsibly except more of the same mismanagement that got us here in the first place, out of control spending. Even financial institutions like Scotiabank have warned that their continued spending drives higher inflation. You can't spend inflation away. Isn't it true, Mr. Speaker, life is continuing to get worse, not better for Canadians under these Liberals, and they have no idea how to deal with it. That side ran on a platform to spend even more deficit spending than we did. On this side, we have an affordability plan, Mr. Speaker. We created the Canada Child Benefit, which is right now putting $13,666 into the pockets of a single mother with two kids. We have indexed OAS and are increasing it. We are making sure there is a $500 home credit for people struggling with housing. Mr. Speaker, no plan for affordability on that side, a clear plan on this side. UCP leadership hopeful and former Alberta Finance Minister Travis Taves says he has a plan to make life more affordable for Albertans. He says if he was to become the next Premier, he would make the provincial fuel tax suspension of 13 cents a litre permanent. I will commit, and I have committed, that if I have the privilege of serving Albertans as Premier, I will bring that fuel tax suspension program and make it permanent. Uh, Here's the reality. Albertans can benefit from an owned resource. And when energy prices go up, our revenues as a government from non-renewable resource royalties eclipse that 
of the fuel tax. And that, else, that allows us to ensure that when energy prices are high, the fuel tax comes off, meaning that Albertans have, will have, by and large, the lowest fuel prices in the country. Make sure you catch the full 15-minute exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with UCP leadership hopeful Travis Taves and myself coming up after business news. Alberta NDP leader Rachel Notley says with a high cost of inflation, Albertans have less and less buying power each and every month. She says decisions made by the Kenny government over the past 24 months have made matters much worse for many families. They've raised personal income taxes, they've raised property taxes, they've raised school fees, they've raised tuition, they've raised interest on student debt, they've raised camping fees, they've raised utilities, they've raised car insurance. So the bottom line is this, today we are calling on the UCP to take this problem seriously to reconvene the legislature and undo the hurtful policies that they have put in place that are making life so difficult for Alberta families. We would be happy to work with them on it. We hear one or two of their leadership candidates are even finally, after pretending that these policies were good policies, are now themselves running on reversing them. So if they're serious about it, they will join our call to come back to the legislature and actually make the changes that will ensure that Alberta families have a little bit more in their pocket. The UCP announced that more than $58.7 million will be spent to support 78 road, bridge, community airport and water infrastructure projects across Alberta. Officials say the projects will improve water and wastewater services, along with access to clean drinking water for rural communities. The projects are also anticipated to create around 800 jobs during construction. Minister of Transportation Prasad Panda says the initiative will also provide just over $27 million in grants for municipalities. And the total cost of all these projects is actually more than $184 million. The Water for Life program supports critical clean water supply for residents in smaller communities and regional projects across uh, rural Alberta. Projects receiving funding include a raw water supply pipeline right here in Foothills County and Okotoks. The pipeline will provide uh, reliable access to clean drinking water and support uh, future growth, both in important industries and homes in the region. Albertans 18 years of age or older can now get their second booster dose of a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine five months or more after receiving their first booster shot. Health officials say this dose is very beneficial to those at high risk of severe outcomes. The province says those who received one dose of Janssen at least two months ago are also now eligible for a booster dose. Appointments can be made by calling 811. The Kenny government says those with opioid addictions who are taken into custody by RCMP in Red Deer will now have immediate access to addiction treatments. Officials say the expansion of Alberta's virtual opioid dependency program comes after seeing increased cases in Red Deer, Lethbridge, Calgary and Edmonton. The program offers same-day access to opioid addiction treatment for anyone in the province. Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions Mike Ellis says having access to help right away will save more lives. That means uh, same-day access to life-saving opioid addiction treatment medications like Suboxone and Methadone and the new long-acting Sublocade. Once we eliminated the wait list for BODP, we started looking at how we can help more people access addiction treatment. That's when we began bringing police and health services together to ensure that any Albertan who is arrested for any reason can access life-saving addiction treatment. A fundraiser for those with breathing problems has hit a temporary roadblock here in Alberta. The Walk to Breathe initiative was created by an Edmonton man to raise funds for Alberta Lung. As BCN's Mike Quinn explains now, the man says he has to sit out this year's festivities due to health issues, but is hoping that other Albertans will be able to help pick up the slack. Truth be told, I was walking with a cane for, uh, for a few months there at the end of last year and, and into uh, 2022. I just thought something's not right. And I know that I've been dealing with uh, arthritis and, uh, and gout flare-ups for, for many years, like 20, 
20 plus years. The Walk to Breathe fundraiser covered over 840 kilometers and raised close to $100,000 during his first two years. The founder of the walk, Chris Sadler, has been forced to sit out this year's festivities after his doctors told him he shouldn't be participating. Now he's calling on Albertans from cities like Edmonton to Lethbridge to take part in a virtual walk from September 1st to the 10th. Sadler says there isn't a monetary goal for this year's virtual affair, but he's hoping that Albertans will help join the cause. The devastation of, um, of lung disease and respiratory ailments from newborn babies to youth to adults to, to the elderly, uh, it affects everyone across every gender. Uh, every race. It's not prejudice uh, against uh, anyone. It will affect anyone and everyone. So the more people that know about it and we keep that top of mind, that's really the goal. The funds for this year's event will go towards supporting services and programs provided by Alberta Lung, including the construction of the breathing space, a facility where lung transplant patients and their families have a place to stay to regain their strength during the intense process. $15 million will get the space built. It will have all the fixtures and everything installed. And it also will give us some operating funds. There will be 30 patient and family rooms, a central kitchen, a rooftop garden, all of the facilities that are required to help support them in their journey. It, counseling, emotional well-being is, is a particular um, of importance to us. For more information on this year's virtual walk, you can contact Sadler by visiting his Facebook page. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. The Transportation Safety Board has been called in to investigate where a float plane went down, injuring all six people on board in southern British Columbia. The plane crashed Sunday in what is being described as an emergency landing at Lorna Lake in the South Chilcotin Mountains. Tyax Air Services, which operates the plane, says the crash triggered an emergency locator transmitter and rescuers reached the scene within hours, airlifting the injured to hospital. Police say a gunman who shot five people at a suburban Indianapolis shopping center, killing three before a shopper shot and killed him, was a 20-year-old man who was apparently facing eviction. A motive by the attacker is still unknown. Forensic team has his cell phone. Uh, it was wet. Uh, They're going through the process of drying it out to try to extract information from it. Right now we have no motive. Um, fam his family members that we spoke to, uh, they were just as surprised as everyone else was. They said there were no indicators that he was uh, violent or unstable. The searing hot temperatures continue throughout much of Europe, including in Greece, where firefighters are battling a number of blazes. Hundreds of people have been evacuated from their homes near Mount Penteli, which is northeast of the Greek capital of Athens. Officials say dry conditions and strong winds are helping to fuel a wildfire, which has been threatening the entire community. Υπάρχουν δυνάμεις, υπάρχουν επιχειρούν και ένα αέριο, αλλά είναι πολύ δυνατός ο άνεμος, όπως φαίνεται άλλωστε, και στροβιλίζει συνεχώς και αλλάζει φορά του αέρα. Meanwhile, in France, more firefighters are being sent to the southwest part of the country to combat the spreading wildfires in that region. More than 200 reinforcements are being added to the 1,500 firefighters who are battling around the clock to help contain the wildfires. Authorities have announced plans to evacuate around 3,500 people or those who are most at risk. The blazes are being fed by hot swirling winds, which have hit much of Europe. Well, here in southwestern Alberta, we had another hot one today in Lethbridge, and the scoring hot temperatures should remain with us for the rest of the week. A full look at the weather picture is coming up. You know, so far, there's no heat warning for our region, but it has been nice and hot. Jeanette Roche is in now with a full look at the weather picture. Jeanette, will we get close to breaking any heat records this week in Lethbridge? You know, not quite, Hal. Most of the record-breaking days this week were in the mid to upper 30s. This week, we are looking at temperatures hovering around the low 30s and even into the 20s. So not quite record-breaking weather, but extremely warm, absolutely. Sunshine and 32 degrees. Could see a humid X up to 36 on Thursday. Friday, high 27. Could see the possibility of some showers developing Friday evening and into Saturday. Also, we're looking at a possible 60% showers in the morning on Saturday, 26 the high. On Saturday, 
Sunday back up to 30 degrees with lots of sunshine. 26 on Monday and a high of 27 on a Tuesday is expected with partly cloudy skies. So we're definitely looking at that typical warm July weather. Average high for this time of year, 26, average low 11. 35 was our high temperature on this day back in 2003 and in 1990, uh, sorry, 1977 that is. Uh, three degrees only, can you believe that, for the middle of July? Uh, 546 is when the sun rose this morning. Our sun set this evening at 9 at 29 p.m., giving us about 15 hours and 43 minutes of daylight. So we're definitely less than 16 hours these days. On the West Coast, tomorrow, looking at a high of 23 degrees in Victoria, windy in the Juan de Fuca Strait, cooler by the water, of course, as always. 23 in Vancouver, warmer inland, some fog in some low-lying areas there as well. Edmonton's high 26 tomorrow, sunny skies there, and a high of 28 tomorrow in Calgary. Calgary could see a little bit windy conditions as well. And some humid humidity as well. Humidex up to 29. 28 degrees the high in Saskatoon tomorrow. Same thing for Regina. Both of those cities seeing lots of sunshine. Same thing for Winnipeg. Beautiful sunny skies. 28 the high should so just be very lovely and warm across the prairies tomorrow. 27 the high in Toronto tomorrow. Uh, Toronto was under a heat warning and a severe thunderstorm watch tonight. Uh, could see a little bit of reprieve tomorrow with high 27. Same thing for Ottawa as well. 29 the high tomorrow in Montreal. They could see uh, some showers and a risk of a thunderstorm there. 31 degrees in Fredericton. That's really hot for that area. Partly cloudy skies, sunshine in Halifax tomorrow. 30 degrees the high there. 29 in Charlottetown and 23 degrees in St. John's, Newfoundland with 40% chance of showers and some windy conditions as well. So there you have it. That is your forecast. Some economists are saying that inflation may have peaked in Canada. The annual consumer price index climbed to 8.1% in June. Now that's the highest yearly rate increase in close to 40 years. It was up from 7.7% in May. Stats Canada says the acceleration in June was largely driven by higher fuel prices, which rose by more than 50% since 2021. Economists say gas prices should begin to come down soon after having seen inflation peak. Tesla CEO Elon Musk lost his fight to delay Twitter's lawsuit against him. A judge in Delaware set an October trial. Twitter executives are suing Musk for pulling out of the $44 billion U.S. deal to buy the social media platform. There's a lot of legal experts who they think that the Delaware court is sensitive to the question of, of, of somebody just wanting to get out of a deal for because of buyer's remorse. Like th There has to be a really good reason why they would back out of, of an agreement they made with the company they're trying to buy. Um, and so if Twitter can really focus on that argument, it seems like it has a pretty good case. On the other hand, Elon Musk seems to think he has a pretty good case showing why the problem with bots is, is not something that Twitter has been transparent enough. The European Union is proposing that member states cut their gas use by 15% over the coming months to blunt the impact of any Russian cutoff of natural gas supplies. While the initial cuts would be voluntary, the EU Commission is also asking for the power to impose mandatory reductions in case of an emergency. The Commission's president says Russia is blackmailing Europe and accuses Vladimir Putin of weaponizing gas exports. EU member states will discuss the measures at an emergency meeting of energy ministers set for next Tuesday. Now is a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 82 points in the day to finish at 19,020. The Dow was up 47 points to 31,874. The S&P 500 was up 23 points to 39.59. And the Nasdaq was up 184 on the day to 11,897. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.96 to 102.26 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was up 60 cents to 787 U.S. Gold was up 9 cents to 1696.67 U.S. an ounce, and silver was up a cent to 18.69 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $11.70 per bushel, barley's at 8.71, canola's at 18.69, and corn is at $10.57 per bushel. Live cattle August contract was up 3 cents to 135.75. Feeder cattle August contract was down 93 cents to 177.83. And Lean Hogs July contract was up 205 to 11488. The Canadian dollar was even over the past 24 hours at 7762 US.
Recapping one of our top stories, the cost of filling up your vehicle rose more than 50% in June compared with a year ago. Those prices are to blame for inflation skyrocketing to 8.1% last month. Stats Canada says that is up from 7.7% in May and marks the largest yearly change since 1983. Alberta's former finance minister, Travis Taves, says he has a plan to help make life more affordable for Albertans should he win the UCP leadership and become our next premier in October. He will explain an exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with me in just a moment. Things are really starting to heat up in the race to succeed Jason Kenney as premier of Alberta and the new leader of the UCP. Former Alberta Finance Minister Travis Taves is one of the candidates who's hoping to secure enough of the vote to become our new leader. MLA Travis Taves joins us now from Edmonton. Travis, welcome to Bridge City News. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Now, there's been a bit of infighting within the party, within the UCP. What do you think it will really take to unite the Conservatives once again as we head into next year's provincial election? Sure. You know, there's, there's been a lot of division. Uh, in the last couple of years in our communities, um, you know, businesses, sadly, even in some of our, our faith communities, churches, and, and tragically, even in families, our conservative movement hasn't been exempt of that division. And, uh, you know, as I travel around the province and, and hear from conservative-minded Albertans, I'm always interested in their perspective in terms of how do we go on from here? Because it's been a tough two years. No, I would suggest there's a couple of things that are very important. Number one, I really believe that it'll be critical for our big tent diverse party, our big tent diverse conservative movement, that we again focus on those core values that unite us, the values of uh, fiscal responsibility, a commitment to you know, a market-based economy, and the commitment to uh, the value, core value of individual freedom and liberty and limited government. And I believe if we can focus again on those core values, the values that united us in 2019, uh, that, that we can again come together. Instead of focusing on those issues that divide, those issues will always be there. But look, we have a big tent diverse uh, movement and party. That's also what makes us strong. I believe that's also what makes us fit to govern. Now we talk about a big tent obviously, but what about social conservatives within the party? How can you ensure as leader that they won't be shut out? Well, look, um, many of my personal views would align with the views of social conservatives. That's, that's where I am personally. And yet, I, I deeply respect the views of others right across um, the spectrum of our conservative movement. There, you know, there are many, many uh, positions held on, on social issues, uh, held passionately by really good people right across the spectrum. And we have to, we have to recognize that and respect that. Um, I, again, I will ensure that every MLA has a voice in this caucus, that every MLA has the ability to bring their views and the views of their constituents passionately to the caucus table. I've got a plan to manage caucus so that all MLAs can firstly represent their constituents fairly and accurately, and secondly, bring their own personal views to the table and advocate for those. Rachel Notley and the NDP have been acting like a government in waiting, coming up with plans to help our economy get back on track. What do you think it'll take to help many of our small to medium business owners get back to black like the province is trying to get right now as we make our way out of the pandemic? I know we no longer have the, uh, the deficit, but we still have a debt that we're tackling. Sure. Well, well, one thing we won't do is what the NDP did in 2015. And that's raise taxes, create extra regulatory burden and hurdles that sent tens of billions of dollars of capital out of the province and ultimately um, undermined our economic growth in this province, uh, put us really into recession and left far less opportunity for our small businesses and entrepreneurs. The last two years has been, have been very tough for many of our small businesses, especially those in hospitality, uh, those in accommodation, tourism, for instance. Now, Alberta uh, provided more support than any other province to our small businesses, but I don't want to pretend that that support covered all the losses. It didn't. I know it's been tough. Look, I'm a small business owner as well. The way we've benefited and the way we've seen others benefit is, is when we see general strength in the economy. When there's investment returning back to the province, when folks are moving back into Alberta like they are again today, that creates increasing opportunity for entrepreneurs and small businesses to benefit um, in, in their business enterprises. 
So again, I we will do, I would do, if I have the privilege of serving Albertans as their premier, I will continue to do all I can to ensure Alberta is most competitive in all of our key sectors, including to the tourism sector, which we have great potential and we have great plans to ultimately grow that sector, but also in areas like, you know, the, the petrochemical industry where tens of billions of dollars are stacked up to come in. The tech sector right now is growing in leaps and bounds. I've understood there's, there's 3,000 unfilled positions in Calgary alone in the tech sector. We're seeing strength in film and television. We've seen that industry grow from $100 million a year to over a billion an annually. We're seeing strength in the manufacturing sector. De Havilland, they announced that they were going to move their water bomber manufacturing plant, not into Quebec, where they get government subsidy, but right here into Alberta. All of that investment coming into the province, I believe, will position Alberta small businesses for recovery and growth in the years ahead. My commitment is to ensure that government creates the most competitive playing field possible. And lastly, the other issue that's really plaguing growth in Alberta businesses is a limitation on labor and talent and skills. Ultimately, employers across sectors and regions are looking for staff and they're having trouble finding those staff. Now, when I was finance minister, I added $600 million to, to better prepare Albertans to engage in this workforce. I did that in the context of a balanced budget. I need to point that out. But we've got a bit of a misalignment with skills. Uh, for many Albertans today, we need to ensure that we're investing in those individuals so they can participate in this new and more diverse economy. So Travis, you talked about, you know, how Alberta is trying to diversify its economy, not just the energy sector, but the IT sector with technology, film and television. What about our farmers? What can you really do to help our producers if you become leader? You, you, you know that, uh, you know, one of our core businesses is a cattle ranching operation. I'm a past president of the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. I have great affection for agriculture, and I believe it has incredible potential in the province of Alberta. Look, I came from New York a few months ago as the Minister of Finance meeting with, with the investment community, as you would expect. Um, virtually every conversation morphed to North American energy and food security. Alberta has not only a great opportunity, I suggest a deep responsibility to get on with the responsible, responsible production of both energy and agriculture. And we need to do all we can to position those sectors to be most competitive. I'll be rolling out an agriculture platform here in the upcoming days that will make additional moves on improving the competitiveness of Alberta's agriculture industry and agriculture manufacturing and processing sector. But when I was Minister of Finance, I approved um, major uh, generational investments in irrigation. Again, I've, I've been... Um, you know, as I travel Southern Alberta and I see the incredible generational investments that were made at the early part of the 1900s that have served families and communities so well generation after generation, I was inspired to invest further in that agriculture uh, and irrigation sector. Um, I was also instrumental in funding the twinning, the beginning of the twinning of Highway 3, which again was is key infrastructure that, meant that agriculture manufacturers and processors have suggested needs to be improved for them to land their investment here in the province. Now you talk about a lot of your previous successes and accomplishments as finance minister here in Alberta, but a number of Albertans were quite upset during the province's negotiations with our nurses and what appeared to be a pay cut for our healthcare professionals right in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. We weren't out of the woods yet. So how do you respond to that as our province's former finance minister? Sure. Well, I mean, that's that's just simply misinformation. There, there was no pay cut. In fact, I look at, at the negotiations with the public sector broadly, which fell under, under my leadership. Now, it, what, that didn't include physicians, but I was responsible for all of our um, collective bargaining agreements. And I adjusted our, our labor mandate twice in the last 18 months because I had two principles that governed our approach. Number one, we had fiscal objectives, as you would expect as we should have. But secondly, I had a, a second principle, and that was the principle of fairness to both our public sector workers and to ensure that we had a settlement that was fair in the eyes of Albertans, that's important. And so that required an adjustment in the summer of 2021 to the labor mandate, which include increases. I would suggest material increases for our public sector workers, and that included our nurses. 
So I was so pleased when we uh, ultimately completed the, the negotiations with the nurses and nurses ratified the agreement by um, a rate of over 90% in January. In fact, I quoted Heather Smith in my budget speech because her words were so conciliatory to how well the process went. Nurses did end up with a raise. They also uh, ended up with, and appropriately so, with a recognition of their great contribution during this, the last two years during the pandemic. And, and again, we did that all without one day of labor stoppage. We did all of that without any political co or conflict and, and rhetoric in the media. I believe we did it very constructively. Now, Travis, a number of communities, including right here in Lethbridge, are not happy with the province deciding to centralize EMS dispatch services. Many in various communities say it, for it takes far too long for an ambulance to arrive. Now, that extra time could mean the difference between life and death, all in an effort to save, what, around $6 million annually? If you became Premier, would EMS be decentralized so municipalities can take back control once again? But look, on, on that issue, I know that Minister Copping is working with municipalities and service providers on the issue, but here, this is my broad approach. Based on my observations, uh, AHS is failing Albertans and more importantly, frontline healthcare professionals because of their highly centralized decision-making structure. My direction is always to de decentralize. I believe the best decisions are made by those closest to the front lines. And that would go for EMS as well. Now let's talk about gas prices for just a moment here. Why is it, in your opinion, that in Toronto motorists are paying about a buck sixty a liter, while many here in Alberta, including right here in Lethbridge, is a dollar eighty three, even though the province paused the fuel tax of thirteen cents a liter? How would you address this issue as premier? Sure. Well, I will say Ontario followed Alberta's lead eventually in reducing their their fuel tax as well. And uh, right now, we, I check gas prices, as you would expect, I check them quite regularly. And there's about a five cent differential. I think Ontario right now, Toronto is about five cents lower than Alberta. And uh, there are also, you know, as we know, many dynamics that take place in terms of fuel pricing. Sometimes you'll get a price war going on in a certain region, and that can drop prices sometimes five, 10, even 15 or 20 cents. But what I know is this, uh, after suspending the fuel tax, Alberta, has, has had the lowest on average fuel prices in, in the whole country uh, during the time on average. That's really important. Let's look at prices in Montreal or Vancouver. They're, they're you know, massively higher than they are here in Alberta today. And I, I will commit, and I have committed, that if I have the privilege of serving Albertans as Premier, I will bring that fuel tax suspension program and make it permanent. Uh, Here's the reality. Albertans can benefit from an owned resource. And when energy prices go up, our revenues as a government from non-renewable resource royalties eclipse that of the fuel tax. And that, us, that allows us to ensure that when energy prices are high, the fuel tax comes off, meaning that Albertans have, will have, by and large, the lowest fuel prices in the country. A number of premiers, Travis said, during the pandemic that a number of missteps were made because this is uncharted waters, uncharted territory for many of our leaders during the pandemic. What missteps do you think were made within the Kenny government and what do you think maybe the government can learn from this or you can learn from it potentially as a leader to help you to grow and be even a better leader? Sure. No, that, that's a great question. And, and I will say this, that, you know, the, the government uh, navigated the, the time of the pandemic very imperfectly. And, and, and I know that for sure. I know, I know of certain mistakes that I could call out today. And I know there were other errors that uh, per perhaps we're not even aware of yet. Number one, I would appoint uh, an independent body to do a third party review on the government of Alberta's response during COVID. Look, I think it's going to be, I think it's critically important that uh, Albertans know where the government made perhaps responsible, correct decisions and where the government erred over the last two years. I think that's critically important. And it's critically important to inform future governments should we face uh, a challenge like this in the future. One other learning was to be very careful to um, in making definitive statements. The easiest way to break trust with an electorate is to make a definitive statement and go back on that statement or your word. That immediately uh, breaches trust uh, between, between a government and, and constituents. One thing we also learned is that Alberta has um, very inadequate healthcare capacity, particularly in, in key areas like ICU. 
You know, I, I didn't realize this going in, but Alberta, the highest funding healthcare jurisdiction in Canada on a per capita basis, had the lowest number of baseline ICU beds on a per capita basis. That, that ultimately limited the runway materially in terms of the options that government had. So one thing that I, I'm committed to, and one thing budget 2022 actually also reflects is additional investment in healthcare to expand healthcare capacity in key areas where the pandemic showed we were very deficient, including ICU capacity. Well, we only have a couple of moments left here, Travis, but I wanted to talk about the anti-Ottawa sentiment here in Alberta it continues to grow. Many Albertans feel a really strong disconnect with the Trudeau Liberals. There's even more talk of Western separation. What do you say to those who want to see Alberta become its own sovereign nation? Well, look, I, I absolutely agree that we need to take a page out of Quebec's playbook and make incremental changes that, that improve Alberta's lot in confederation. But one of those pages is not separation. You know, when, when Quebec got close to separation, threatened to separate, there were a lot of things that took place. One of them was tens of billions of dollars of capital fled that economy. As I talked to folks who were close to the issue, they said you couldn't rent a moving van in Montreal for a year and a half with all the head offices that moved from Montreal down to Toronto and Bay Street. That's what helped build Bay Street. I will not take that approach as the premier of the province. We've made great gains in this economy. We cannot see those eroded. But what we can do is take a page out of Quebec's playbook in this way. Every time Quebec has had a government in Ottawa that needs Quebec politically, and that's been far too often with the Liberals holding power too many years in this country, Quebec has made incremental gains because they've known they've had significant political clout. Alberta's not done that. You know, we had, we were governed extremely well during the Harper years as a nation, I believe. But during that time, when we had a conservative government in, in Ottawa, that depends on Alberta politically. I can't identify one material change that we made to equalization, for instance, or fiscal stabilization, any federal fiscal transfer program. I, you know, we didn't make a move on an, on an Alberta pension plan or lobby hard for tax points to erode Alberta's tax or Ottawa's taxation power right. and move that power to provinces. We can never let an opportunity like that pass again. Now, there are many things we can do between now and when we get a more favorable government in Ottawa. We won't sit on our hands, but I would suggest this. I would bring an assertive and strategic approach, not the approach that has failed Albertans in the past, one full of political bluster and rhetoric over-promising and under-delivering. Former Alberta Finance Minister and current UCP leadership candidate, Travis Taves, thanks so much for joining us today from Edmonton. It's, my, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Hal. You know, with all of the pressures of the world today, it seems that the number of people struggling with both anxiety and depression is on the rise. So how can we effectively deal with this? Where can we go for help? Today's guest may have some answers for us. Jeff Peabody is the founding pastor of New Day Church in Federal Way, Washington, and he's also author of the book, Perfectly Suited, The Armor of God for the Anxious Mind. Pastor Jeff, welcome to Bridge City News. Oh, thanks for having me on. It's a privilege to be here. Now let's talk a bit about anxiety and depression. Now these are things you've dealt with personally. When did you first realize that you were struggling? Uh, you know, honestly, uh, I was pretty disconnected from my emotions much of my life. I, I really was not very aware of what was going on inside of me. I think maybe that's a typical male. Um, but, um, you know, even, even when you can't access your feelings, they're still happening. And, and uh, eventually they're going to find a way to, to make their way out. And, and it was like my brain and my body decided that they were going to find a way to get my attention. And for me, that meant uh, I, I kind of hit this emotional and mental wall where everything just sort of began to crumble. And I, I found myself just um, bombarded and flooded with all these intrusive thoughts and I couldn't stop my mind. It just kept spinning. And I didn't realize at the time that that was kind of classic symptoms of uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, which is an anxiety disorder. So I, I, I did not know what to do with this. And it was, it's 
scary when you're frightened of your own mind. And um, I didn't know what to do. And so I went on a walk with a friend of mine who happens to be a, a counselor. And as we're walking along and I'm so baffled and I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm crying and which is also uncharacteristic of me. And, and I, I make the statement, I said, I'm, I'm not an anxious person. And he laughed and it, it totally caught me up short. I was not expecting that at all. And it made me realize, oh, I, I'm not as self-aware as I thought I was. And, um, and that sort of began a long journey of me uh, right up till today of, of beginning to um, recognize more of what's, what's been going on inside for me. Now, you're right that you wanted to be a very strong Christian most of the time, but that you felt guilty. Where did that guilt come from? You know, uh, I, I was raised in a devout Christian home, and I'm really grateful for that, that upbringing. Um, but I think anybody that's been raised in the faith uh, knows how difficult it is as a kid to make the distinction between messages of grace and the gospel and the messages about behavior, good behavior, and what a good Christian looks and acts like. And I think for me, I, I began to internalize this, this pressure of wanting to, be, wanting to uh, earn approval and um, live up to what was expected of me. And I, I always had a sort of a hyperactive conscience as a kid. But then I think as an adult, as, as Christians, we can easily fall into that sensation of, of wanting to please God and also wondering if he really is. And we lose sight of, of the gospel message that he's pleased with. Christ. And if we're in Christ, then, uh, then we have that for our protection. You know, I think when we get anxious or depressed, we're really hesitant to reach out for help. We say, you know what? I got this. I've got this covered. I can do it on my own. But no man or woman is an island, correct? Right, right. And I think especially for us as Christians, we can have that added spiritual layer to it where we go, oh, I, it's wrong for me to feel this way. And and uh, it, it's a sign of uh, my faith not being strong enough, or maybe I feel like I'm sinning because the Bible says don't be anxious. And so we, we compound people's pain with the added layer of, of guilt and feeling like uh, if I was a good Christian, I wouldn't even feel this way. Now, the Bible refers to spiritual attacks on Christians. How would you define spiritual warfare? And how can we really recognize if the anxiety and mental health struggles are spiritual in nature? You know, spiritual warfare is, is one of those topics that Christians tend to go one or, or two ways. Either, either we just ignore it or uh, don't want to acknowledge that it's a thing at all, or we go the other way and start to see a demon behind every tree and every little crisis we're experiencing we attribute to some sort of spiritual attack. Uh, and, and as I was going through my own anxiety, I went through all those things of going, you know, well, is this, is this a sign of either me sinning or something more sinister going on spiritually? And I think at the end of the day, the, the cause is, is less significant than the fact of, of when we're feeling afflicted and that we, we need God's mercy. And, um, so I, I tend to just define spiritual warfare as really anything that has a negative effect on our spirits. That uh, the, the devil can use whatever's going on in our life, whether he caused it or not. And we do have a definite spiritual enemy, um, but, but it really doesn't matter what the source of that attack is because, because it can be um, used, used against us um, by the devil. Now, Pastor Jeff, in the Bible, Scripture tells us to always put on the armor of God. But many of us aren't exactly sure what that means or how to apply this to our daily lives in the battle against anxiety and fear. Can you explain? Yeah, the ironic thing, I think, about the armor when we, when we generally conceive of it is that it, it becomes one more thing that we need to do correctly. And so we start to think of, well, how am I supposed to put this on uh, and, and really, the, the Greek word there in Ephesians for, for putting it on can also be translated as to sink into, which I find a, a very different image uh, because that requires so much less effort of my, uh, my own doing. And, and I can just instead rest in, in what God has provided for me in this armor. And that's really, that's really what he's saying is that the protection is provided by him. It's not something that we're generating on our own. In our family, we have a lot of millennials and Gen Z. 
people, and uh, a lot of these people struggle with anxiety and depression on an incredible level right now. Why do you think so many of our, our young people are struggling today with both anxiety and depression? Hmm. That is a really good question. I think, I think it is a very uh, much pronounced uh, sensation for, for the younger generations. I think um, culturally, uh, all, the, all the pressure that arises from social media, I think, plays into that. Um, I think there is such an uncertainty about uh, our world and, and what the future looks like. And I think um, all of that feeds into um, just this heightened sense of, of not being sure of things. And so that, that all feeds into anxiety. And it's, it's especially high, I think, um, for, for younger generations. You know, it's interesting, when I was a kid playing football and just in high school and then college afterwards, we used to have the expression, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But it seems like names today are really hurting people. and They're having a, a profound impact on people's lives. Yes, it, is, it's, it really is true that uh, words, words have a much greater impact. And, um, you know, it's interesting in the book of Revelation when it gets to the end and and Jesus assigns a name to each of us that that only He knows and only only we know. And and that idea of care for our identity and and Christ's uh, restoration of that to us. Because um, yeah, there's so much right now that just um, we're we're pulling each other down. And um, so yes, um, I'm I'm grateful that that God is concerned even when we feel like oh we shouldn't. We shouldn't have, these things shouldn't bother us. Um, he cares about the things that, that really uh, do cut deep. He cares about the little things and the big things. Pastor Jeff, in your book, you talk about God's will for us not to move at all or to move slowly. Why is it so important to maybe slow down in life? I, I have always had the kind of personality where um, if, if, I, if I read in scripture of, of what God's ultimate goal for me is, where he would like me to, to get to, then, then a lot of times I can start to feel like if I'm not quite there yet, then I must be failing or I'm outside of God's will. And, and one of the things that's really helped me is to look at the incarnation of Jesus and go out, uh, you know, yes, of course, um, his salvation of us through the cross is God's ultimate plan for his life, and yet he had to go through all of life. He had to go through the growing up and um, adolescence and becoming an adult, and and all of that was fully within God's will, and it, it made me realize God, God has room. Uh, it, it's good to have process. It's not just the end result of things, and so to allow the process to be what it is, I think, uh, and especially even when we look at Jesus on the cross right there, where, where the biggest thing he did was not leave the cross. He stayed right where he was, as excruciating as everything was that was happening. And um, so, I, yeah, I think that idea of it, sometimes it feels very uncomfortable to not be constantly moving forward, but, but to recognize that, that God is at work in the whole process. Now, you write that you've worn the weight of Christian duty heavily. What exactly do you mean by that, and how has this really impacted your faith journey? Yeah, the, the whole concept of responsibility for me, what am I supposed to do, has, has been a, a mantle that's been heavy on my shoulders a lot. And sometimes that can take you out of the room entirely of relationship or, or um you know, I, I like to phrase it this way, that I've, I've often been more concerned about living a sinless life than living as a forgiven person. Because I think if, if, we, if we can settle into the idea that God loves us and forgives us, then we can go, well, if, that, if I really believe that's true, then I'm going to be more forgiving towards other people. If I, if I believe that God loves me, I'm not going to be as judgmental of other people. I'm going to be able to have have more room and capacity um, for that. So I think being able to to not frame it up so much in terms of duty and responsibility, instead live out of being loved by God, um, is is liberating for me. 
So Pastor Jeff, how does entrusting God with all of these aspects of our lives function as a shield? Well, I think it gets back to Christ because, you know, when, when I, when I am um, anxious about myself and I begin adopting all my normal, what I call the armor of me, all these feelings, defenses that I'm going to, I'm going to try to make myself okay. I, I always have in the back of my mind, that little wondering question, am I actually doing enough that, that God's going to be satisfied with this? Uh, but but when I can step back and go, Christ always pleases His Father, and what He did on the cross can't be undone. And I and I and I decide to uh, embrace that fully and let that be my my protection. And th then that serves as a shield. And I know that no matter what happens, no matter how I fall or or um, fail, that that I am I am safe uh, because. God is always pleased with Jesus. Now, you make an interesting statement here that says, it's an illusion that a life of trusting God equals fewer problems. Can you explain? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's always the expectation that, that well, if I'm really living the Christian life properly, that God is going to uh, eliminate some of the, the normal things that that I would, I would assume... Um, he takes away when when we're within his will, and that's really just not the case. I mean, look at the life of Jesus and and the suffering he went through, but but we still can get that in our heads mentally that that's what it should mean, and then we get surprised when bad things happen, and uh, we feel like faith isn't working. Then when when really God is demonstrating His presence with us in the midst of of the hard things that we're going through. So what do you really hope readers will discover from reading your book? I think a couple of things. Uh, first off, if somebody is experiencing anxiety and depression, I, I think I would, I would hope they would feel encouraged as they read it that they're not alone, that um, it's okay to seek help. And, um, and also just to go, uh, these, these feelings are not sinful feelings to, to, to take that load of guilt out of the picture, and also just to find it um, freeing and unburdening to look at the armor of God through a different lens and see how it's a gift to us and not another thing that, that we have to do to be a proper Christian. Jeff Peabody is the author of Perfectly Suited, The Armor of God for the Anxious Mind. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us today from just outside of Seattle, Washington. Well, thank you for having me. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and thanks for watching.